the sun's going to rise almost directly behind her. And also with her are her two cubs, Shongire and Hassan. Beautiful and cool this morning. About nine degrees Celsius where we are. Oh, on the bottom, stalking sibling time. six months old and already moving like an apex predator. Oh. With that flat to the ground, all this play between the siblings is going to be really important. It hones their hunting skills. Siblings coming down towards us. There we go. Oh. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? Now we are sitting live with a female leopard and her two cubs in on Juma Private Game Reserve in the Greater Kruger National Park. And you can ask us questions about these fantastic animals by using the hashtag Safari Live or send us an email questions at wildearth.tv I have Jandre on camera today oh there we go And in this early morning, I think we're going to be spoiled by quite a lot of playing activity by these little cubs. Nice full bellies. Last night, or yesterday at some point, their mom caught an adult female impala. And she's popped it in a milkberry tree. There's mom. And my name is Brent, as I said, Jandre on camera, Jamie and Dave on the other vehicle, and Rebecca and Chilteen in final control. Isn't this absolutely exciting? Look at that. I think she's just going to lie down. The kill's actually above her. You can see her. She's looking up. I think she's just looking for a spot to have a rest. Oh, she might move the kill to a bit of an easier feeding place. I did see hyena tracks on the ground underneath here. So, there might have been hyena here during the night. Condensation. She's going up the tree. The kill is still quite high in quite a precarious position. But you can see, there's the kill. How incredibly agile these big cats are. Now, normally a kid of that size would last a single leopard or single female leopard for a day or two. Or maybe even three. But with these cubs, they've eaten so much since we were here last night. And we've got one of the little guys underneath the vehicle, underneath the, the, the kill. Who is that? Shungile or Hosan? I can't really see just yet. And you can see those little rotund bellies. Oh, 
while we sit here, uh, Jamie would like to say good morning to you. So while the cubs are in the thicket, uh, let's go see what Jamie's up to. I would very much like to say a good morning to all of you. And good morning. My name is Jamie, and I have Dave on camera with me this morning. And we are sitting right now at Sydney's Dam. So Brent, of course, already has the lovely little leopard cups of Karula. We're sitting at Sydney's Dam because, first of all, I heard a lion calling from here. And second of all, there's mating cats. I don't know what they are. I don't know whether it is leopard or lion. But some, some big cat is mating just just over there which is so frustrating because it is north of our boundary so we can't actually go and move into that area and check up on what they are doing but they are hopefully I'm really hoping that they are moving south not sure if it's leopards or if it's lions as I said I think it might be lions because there was calling this morning just before we set off on our sunrise safari then if I don't have any luck here, I'm just going to sit and listen for another few minutes. But if I don't have any luck here, then there's tracks of the Inkahumas going straight back from Arethusa onto Juma. And hopefully we will manage to have more success than we had yesterday afternoon. But at the moment, Sydney's dam is all quiet. Which of course makes total sense since we have had a little bit of rainfall which means that there's plenty of groundwater away from the watering holes, away from the dams. The animals don't have to move into this area in order to have a drink. They're just quite happily drinking away at the puddles. Now, while I sit here and listen and make sure that what I heard was, because I think it was leopard, I don't know, I'm in two minds. So while I sit here and try and listen and get an idea of what exactly it was that we heard, I'm going to send you back to Brent and those lovely, what is it, delectable little monsters. Mom's feeding on the carcass and these two are having the best game. And you can't actually see. There we go. Just in front. There we go, you see, there we go, there the head pops up. <laughs> oh, pulse! <laughs> Isn't that just too cute? Now, we're not going to move. I'm pretty sure they will take their game to a nice clear area in front of us at some point. The nice thing about being able to come to a static sighting where they've got a kill, get here early in the morning while it's still cold, and the cubs will almost certainly be at play at this time in the morning. Who's going to make a dash? Who's going to be the chaser? What you found there? What is that little one found doing in the sand there? Oh. Now we know who made the dash. Well, Kay Ward's wondering, are the cubs still at risk for hyenas? Uh, or are they big enough to get away? Okay, um, they're always at risk. A leopard's always at a risk, even in its adult life risk for hyenas uh, or they're big enough to get away okay um they're always at risk a leopard's always at a risk even in its adult life to hyenas 
but at the moment now they're pretty safe. They're very agile and they're very fast, so they can probably get away. So I don't want to take my eyes off. I want to see whether I can just make one of them out next to that acacia there. We're going to wait for them to Which way are they going to go? I'm hoping they run down into the riverbed. So, for those of you who might have missed yesterday's sunset safari, we actually found them on foot. We tracked them all the way from near the southern boundary. And there's mom having a feast. I'm just trying to keep an eye on where the cubs are in case they pop out. Remember, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. And we're sitting with the Queen of Juma, Karula, and her two cubs, Shongile and Hosanna. Just to the right of the Tumbuti tree, they're about to pop back out, or at least one of them is. Now, where's the other? Stalking its sibling, no doubt. Oh, yeah, it's coming. Oh, the stalker has now become the stalky. Just off to the right is the second cub. There we go. Mary says, look how big they're getting. Um, are they bigger than a normal house cat now? Yes, Mary, they're probably about three times the size of a normal house cat. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Cruiser's on her way down. I had a good morning snack. And it's actually impressive how much of that carcass they've managed to eat overnight. Now, we're going to sit here passionately because I think probably in about 10 minutes or so, that golden light from the rising sun is going to filter into that tree and I think we're going to be spoilt with some spectacular visuals. I wonder if she heard something. She's looking as I said, there's hyena tracks underneath the tree, so hyenas did come here last night. So there's Roundry directly below her. There we go. And boom! Oh, <laughs> he nearly fell down the, the, the riverbank there. That would have been quite fun. Tumbling leopard cubs. So we can actually, oh, there we go. And uh, it is really nice. It's a really beautiful spot here where she's decided to hoist this kill. We're right in the middle of the marae. Oh, up the tree. Oh, no, big game. Jump, jump, attack. I can't really 
see them through there. But if we come out, we can actually see that golden light starting to touch the tops of the trees. So here we go, you can see there, you can see that beautiful morning light starting to touch the top of the trees. So I'd say our five to ten minutes, it should be on the leopards below her. Where'd they go? It fell into the other little river system off to the right. Are they going to pop out? Now, Mike was saying when they were younger, it didn't look like they played as much as they're doing at the moment. And is there a particular reason for that? Well, Michael, mostly because they have the ability to escape things like hyenas. And, of course, playing puts you at a bit of risk because you're running around you're not paying so much attention. So, uh, oh, coming out below, out into the open. Here we go. So that's why playing now. Oh, got a bit of fluff. Haha, <laughs> my fluff. Uh, where's a sibling? Because... When you have a piece of fluff, your sibling always wants it. Sorry, Michael. So as I was saying, they're more likely to be more playful as they get older, as they are better, better equipped to escape animals like hyenas. They can jump and climb. So, Andrea, are you ready? Number two is coming in for the attack. Stalky stalk. Oh, have I been spotted? I must go down. <laughs> uh, escape up the tree. <clears throat> that was a clever move. We're going to have attack from above. There's a bit of a tail grab, attempted tail grab there. And, oh, here we go. Oh, no, Fluff is distracted. coming down. Not looking like the most agile little leopard, but that's because it's playing rather than actually climbing. It's playing with its own tail. Look at that. It's biting its own tail. Oh. <laughs> now, normally mom's tail is the favorite play toy or brother or sister's tail. But in extreme cases, if you can't get hold of another tail, you can always just play with your own. I hope you guys are getting some fantastic screenshots of this. Now, Zoe's wondering at what age do leopards reach maturity and their, their full size. With males, it's probably around six, six years old. Females, around oh, three, three and a half, four. The males need a bit more time to develop, get bigger, stronger to challenge for territory. Uh, 
Now the sun is about to burst through onto these leopards. There you can see the light coming through from the east. Down we go. Let's continue this game terrestrially. What is it seen? It's definitely not stalking mom and it's not stalking a sibling. The siblings are behind. Now they always are more brave when mom is around. So their area of play becomes a bit wider. Maybe it's spotted at Franklin. The second little one is right in front of us still. I'm going to head towards mom, I think. I'm going to stalk mom. No? I'm going to stalk a stick. Oh no, this is, this is so good. Look how it's flattening its body to the ground. What are you caught there? Could be chasing a lizard or a bug as well. Or well, it could just be attacking grass. Off to mom. Mom! Off jumping on mom. Fortunately, we can't see them. We just maneuver around quickly. for the best spot. Corey's wondering, do the leopards leave their car the carcass in the tree once they've finished feeding? Um, or do they bring it down? Are we gonna make it to it? Oof, that was close on there. Now I'm just trying to avoid the VR rig. Let's have a look. There's mom. Um, I don't know where the little one's gone. So, uh, Corey, what normally sometimes bring the carcass down. It's normally a bird like a basilier. Sometimes even I've seen monitor lizards scavenge off a leopard carcass in a tree. I see it, Joe. Okay, let's... Where's taxi? Let's just wait. Cub's going to come to mom. The little one's on its way to mom. Or it's on its way up the tree. One of the two. Up the tree. <laughs> yeah. Oh, big jump. Oh, it's coming back this way. Let me just move forward a bit. So it looks like the cub's heading up towards the carcass. So this is a relatively tricky place to maneuver around in. A 
okay, so while I try to get us into a better spot, uh, let's go see how, what Jamie's up to. And as Brent repositions the vehicle, we are cruising along the northern boundary of Juma to see if we can't catch up with those lions as they wander through towards Torchwood side. I know that Herbert is out as well, helping us out. Uh, we will, together we're sort of, I'm checking the northern boundary, he's following along the tracks, and at some point we're going to meet in the middle and see if we can't find wherever those lions happen to be. So yesterday, yesterday we spent ages trying to find those lions. Apparently, Andrew saw one of the lionesses coming back into Arethusa. So she went to fetch the cubs and brought them back. So it was only one of them that went across the boundary yesterday afternoon. We were desperately trying to follow them and trying to find them. It seems as though they've been sitting on Arethusa, or they sat on Arethusa most of yesterday and then walked back at some point last night. The question now is, they're probably looking to find some food. They were, they weren't, they weren't very hungry, but they were definitely on the prowl looking for any possible opportunities to hunt something. And Amber Eyes, the one of the females in the Unkuhumas, she was definitely looking more empty-bellied than the rest. One of them, I assume it's one of the Unkuhumas, but you've got to be careful of assumptions out here. Somebody is mating with a with a lion on around Sydney's dam. That we know for absolute certain because I sat there for long enough that if it were leopards we would have heard it again because leopards mate more frequently than lions do, especially at this time of the morning. So it was most likely a male lion and that would explain the roaring that we heard. And the question, um, another question is whether or not it was one of the Nkuhuma females that he is mating with or a female from another pride. Now, last night we actually met somebody who was around the area when the Birmingham boys were born. Uh, he was working for a place called Ngala, which is where James used to work, and he was telling us stories about the, the Birmingham boys when they were very, very young, at sort of, sort of two and a half, three years old, and already causing absolute havoc in the area. It's, it just goes to show that there is an advantage to having five young males in the same area or in the same pride forming a coalition. Because at that age, at sort of two and a half, three years old, most male lions, aha, most male lions are still relatively ensconced in the safety of their pride. They're not up to too much. I think it's safe to say that Herbert has parked the vehicle and gone walking. So Herbert's had a similar idea to mine in that they're going to be somewhere around this drainage line system. Let's have a quick stop off at Buffelzook Dam, see what's cracking here. It worked out well for us yesterday at Red Dam when Tingana wandered onto the scene completely by surprise. There's Buffelzook Major and Minor. Plenty of water around. Not so much in the way of animal life. But I said that about Red Dam yesterday and Tingana just popped out of nowhere. So you never know on these live safari experiences. And it's not just myself that thinks that it's a good idea to check around here. It looks as though Aubrey's just pulled up as well. It seems as though Buffelzook Dam is the place to be on this bright morning. Hmm. So where are those lions hiding? And Shamsun, just while we're talking about our lovely lions, Shamsun would like to know, and I'm just going to watch where Aubrey goes so that we don't end up checking the same places. Shamsun wants to know, is it safe to assume that Amber Eyes is pregnant and how long until we know for certain? Uh, funnily enough, I have my doubts about whether or not she's pregnant. I think that it might even be her that's mating again. She just seems to be cycling very regularly through Easter cycles. It's, it's, it feels like it's been quite frequent that we've seen her mating. She might be pregnant. Uh, if, if so, it is very early stages. We will only know in the next two months or so because it's only in the last month that the lionesses start to show 
the, any signs of pregnancy, when they start to lactate, when their nipples get swollen. Otherwise, it's very, very tricky. They don't give any signs of pregnancy until that last month or so. The same applies to the leopards. So there you go, Shamsa. That's an answer to your question. I don't think that amber eyes... Well, we're not going to see any signs of pregnancy for at least two months. I'm not 100% convinced she's pregnant yet, which makes total sense. Not every fertilization attempt is successful. I assume Herbert's gone for a walk somewhere in this drainage line system. I think I'm just going to go and check the old den site. I don't think, I think that lioness has moved her cubs, but you never know. She might have decided to return them. And we really do have exciting prospects for the Inkahumas because we're going to start seeing all three sets of cubs all together as they start to get, the youngest set starts to get to the stage where mom is introducing them to the rest of the pride and I'm so excited for that. You have no idea and I'm sure you all feel the same as well to have little lion cubs, eight little lion cubs barreling about in a pride that we've become so attached to over the last few months. It'd be an absolute pleasure to just enjoy spending some time with them. Just checking very carefully around here. The ground is still a little bit hard for tracking, or at least for the lions and the leopards to leave footprints in the dirt, unless you are on foot or driving really, really slowly. It becomes very tricky to see tracks, which is why what Brent managed to do yesterday evening in terms of finding Karula was absolutely awesome. especially since she kept walking over his tracks behind him. And speaking of Brent and the, his leopard tracking prowess, let us head back and have a look at the magnificent Queen of Juma and her offspring. And as he said, that gorgeous golden morning light is creeping through from the east. And we've managed to get ourselves on top of the bank and there's Queen Krula there. And just off to her left. Go left a little bit. And they're just behind that bush, but I'm pretty sure they're going to come back now. Attentive mother, ears up, listening, watching those cubs. Oh, look at that incredible color on her coat. Such an exquisite animal. So it looks like she's listening very intently, which she is. So we just heard some alarm calls a little bit earlier, probably about two, three hundred meters from here. So it could be lion, it could be another leopard. So I think she's just listening very carefully to where those alarm calls came from. Yeah, hyenas in the distance. Ooh. It looks like the two 
troubles on their way back shortly. Just to the left of the Timbuti tree on the other side of the little dip there, jean -Ray. There we go. You can see them flitting about in that little window between the two trees. And then we can see how well that camouflage works because can you believe it? There's a leopard right there. There we go. Alice. So Alice is wondering what would happen if a male leopard or hyena came. Well, with hyena, leopards are used to dealing with hyenas. Um, they'd probably just jump up the tree and the hyena would quickly realize it was not going to get too much of a meal out of this and move on. As I said, there were hyena here last night. I could see their tracks under the kill. Now, a male leopard would all depend on the individual male leopard. Uh, but they'd probably steal the kill. And if they managed to steal the kill, then they would probably focus on the kill if it thought it might have fathered the cubs. If it hadn't fathered the cubs or hadn't made it as a female, it would try to kill the cubs and then steal the kill. So in some circumstances, uh, the female might fight to protect the cubs. In most circumstances, she'd try to just get them as far away from that male leopard as possible. coming back towards us. I'm going to stick on mom. The cubs have gone into the little dip. I think they might jump onto mom. So get ready for those screenshots. And remember, share them with us on our Facebook page or use the hashtag Safari Live and share them on Twitter. So cubs are, there we can just see it off to the left, sneaking up on mom. Mom, of course, is quiet. There we go. Oh, yes, look at that in those beautiful lights. Absolutely magic. So that's the reason we moved up onto the top of this bank. Oh, there they are, boom. Come on, little one, come to the light. Step away from the dark side. <laughs> Morning's always good when you manage to work a bit of Star Wars reference into wildlife. Oh, big game going on down there. So, the reason we took our time to move to climb on top of the bank here is because most of their shenanigans are going to happen up here and around the carcass so we're not going to have to move the vehicle as much you okay to the right of Kruda coming in from the base of the tree a little bit more to the right, there's a cub just stalking her. There we go. <laughs> oh, stalking the tree. Oh. 
absolutely beautiful. Look at that. There we go. Everyone, there's your queen. Possibly one of the most well-loved leopards in the world. <laughs> oh, isn't that magnificent? I hope you guys are getting some great screenshots. I've been so enthralled with the leopards that I haven't even taken a picture yet this morning. down. They're just running around everywhere. So it is tempting to move the vehicle, but it's, it's always best to just sit in one spot. They will come out and play where we can see them. And with mom being where she is, we're in a very good spot for that now. Also, if they happen to climb the tree, to go feed on the kill, we also in a good spot for that. So we're gonna sit tight here. There we go. So Anne Marie's wondering, are they old enough to follow mom to view a kill soon? Now Anne Marie, leopards don't really do that. The only animal that really does any sort of teaching hunting are cheetah. Uh, all those hunting instincts are there and they're born with them. They hone them by playing, chasing each other, stalking franklin squirrels and dwarf mongoose. So it's very, very seldom that a, a leopard cub will actually view its mother, take down an animal. Uh, not impossible, but as I said, very uncommon. And they don't need to watch mom to know how to kill. If you watch them playing, those instinctive grabs of the throat, it is in their nature, so to speak. Tumble, tumble down the hill. Oh, and back again. This is just really, really special to be able to spend this much time with them. Oh, boom, attack. Come on, guys, come play in the golden light. Oh, down the hill again. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, hollows in Wisconsin. Oh, there you go. Get away. Oh, it's just too, too precious. Now, Hollows in Wisconsin is wondering, uh, will they all sleep in the tree? Or will mom sleep on the ground with the cubs in the tree? Uh, well, generally, they'll all sleep on the ground. And leopards will, will sleep in trees. Quite often, when it's hot or when they've got a kill. But generally, they will sleep on the ground, even the cubs, and they'll only take to the trees if uh, there's danger around, like hyenas or lions or another male leopard. 
being smaller than a male leopard, they are able to get to the tiniest little branches that those male leopards can't get to. Morning, Francis. Uh, Francis would like to know, has a, has a vulture ever bothered a leopard in a tree? I have seen vultures uh, not bother the leopard itself, but bother its kill, which bothers the leopard. So the leopards will then rush up and chase the vultures away. Generally, they like to use trees like this that have got leaves so the kill is hidden from vultures, but it can happen. I can't see where those little ones are. They're still in the hole. They're still in that deep little spot there. Here we go, you can see the movement of that little bush to the left of Karula. Oh, there we go. Tackle it. <laughs> Defending the high ground and biting a tree for good measure. Oh, down that down the little drainage dip again. And mom just sitting patiently and attentively, making sure that they don't get into too much trouble while they're playing. Now if you hear that, it's not Darth Vader, oh second Star Wars reference of the day. It's Jean-Dre trying to warn his fingertips because um, it was about nine degrees Celsius down here and his hand is on steel while he operates that camera. So every now and then he feels the need to blow warm air on it. I think he's just being soft personally, but I mean, who doesn't like putting their hands on cold steel in the early morning? Here we go. <laughs> Massive game going on. Okay, so while the little ones have disappeared, uh, let's go see how Jamie's doing on this fine winter's morning. At the present moment, Jamie is just surprised by the number of Star Wars references that Brent has made. I had no idea that he was such a Star Wars fan. So you live and learn. Each and every day has something new to offer. Oh, Dave and myself have been occupying ourselves, trying not to be jealous of Brent and the little cubs, because of course he did spend many hours yesterday tracking them. I'm still a little bit jealous, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll go there this afternoon. In the meantime, there's a tree in the road. Thanks, tree. It's okay, I wasn't missing that, I wasn't that attached to that part of my shoulder anyway. In the meantime, we've got lion tracks heading in this direction. I've double-checked the eastern boundary that runs along Torchwood and divides Torchwood and Juma. 
So we can't go on to Torchwood, we can traverse Juma, and they haven't crossed, which is really good news because it means that they're somewhere here. So Herbert is out and about on foot. He encountered a herd of elephants while he was wandering about trekking, so I think he's had to do a little bit of a loop, a bit of a detour in terms of finding those lions. And they've come into an area between a road, for those of you who are familiar with the geography of the area, between Gauri Cutline and Hyena Road, which is definitely where the cubs were being kept at least a couple of times during their younger, younger months. Oh my goodness, so many amazing things happening with Brent and those little leopards. I'm going to go and find these elephants, and while I do, I'm going to send you back across to Brent who is still with those marvellous spotted cats. We've got one little cub. Oh, I think about to be two. <laughs> there we go. Oh, and down in the hole. <laughs> And Queen Krula just sedately observing. Can you hear the morning dawn chorus around us? Oh, there we go, back up. few robins. Well, a very good morning to Scott and Katie who are wondering about leopard territories and how big they are and is it generally the same size for each animal. It most certainly isn't. A leopard's territory is completely dependent on the habitat that they are in. So, for example, in the southern Sabi Sands around the Sand River, a leopard's territory, a female leopard's territory is between 400 and 600 hectares, so about 1,200 acres. And uh, in the northern Sabi Sands where we are, Queen, Queen Karula has got one of the largest. Uh, leopard territories of any leopard in the Sabi in the north in the Sabi sands for a fact and that is due to the fact of the terrain around here so where you've got big rivers or permanent water ri watered rivers like the Sabi and the Sand River there's a lot more bushbuck and Yala and Pala all around those areas and and that's why Sorry, just one second. I'm just listening to the Game Drive channel. And that's why uh, the leopard territories there are smaller. And here, where they have to travel over a bigger area, you don't have as many of these river systems like we're sitting on at the moment. They're very limited. Oh, cubs are back. That cubs are gone. So I will, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a map for you and uh, I'll have, oh, sorry, I'm looking for a map so we can have a, a closer look at so we can have a look at leopard territories. Well, the cubs are being cute, let's stick with them. And what I'm going to do is I will... Let 
draw a map of the different leopard territories we get on Juma. Oh, oh, all the way out along the branch there. Closer to us. Might come up the tree right next to us. Oh, they can look at this coming close to us now. This is really, really beautiful. Oh, look at this right next to us. They live right next to us. up in the tree now the game has moved from a bit further away from us to right next to us next cub up in the tree now here we go climbing almost directly oh look at this look at that agility going up to the kill Um, I'm just gonna, I might have to move the vehicle a little bit. Let me just see what they do, whether they're actually going to start feeding or they're going to keep. Okay, I'm just trying to see. I just want to see whether it goes up or down, but we're probably going to have to move a little bit. So while we move a little bit, uh, Jamie's got a much bigger animal than a leopard cub to show you. While Brent moves around the bush, our elephants are repositioning it for themselves. And we have come upon my personal favourite elephants. Of course, you shouldn't really have favourites. But if I did have a favourite, and I'm not saying I do, well, actually, I'm saying I do, this is my favourite elephant. It is the short-trunked elephant, the female with her lovely little family, including a little female calf that we've watched from when she was probably only a couple of weeks old tottering about on little legs when she was first born when her mother first brought her back onto Juma and when I say that this is the short trunked elephant she has lost at least a third of her trunk we think to a snare so a wire piece of piece of wire that was set out by bushmeat poachers probably not in the sabi sand itself 
because that's an area that is regularly patrolled, but at some point in her life she lost the tip of her trunk. And watching her feed is always an amazing experience. Now, we think that she just couldn't keep up with the rest of her herd, and as a result she separated from them. And we're still not entirely sure if this young female that's on the right here, whether or not she is her daughter, her oldest daughter, or perhaps a younger sister that stayed with the older cow. But there's something truly special about this little elephant family. The female takes, this little female, takes enormous responsibility when it comes to looking after the calf. Either her niece or her younger sister. She's always sort of, if, if the calf is not with mom, then this female is always making sure that she is okay. And of course she's still young. She hasn't quite hit puberty just yet, or sexual maturity. She's got another, I would guess, and say she's got another two or three years before she gets to that stage where she will have babies as a, of her own. But these amazing, amazing animals invest time and energy in babysitting and in looking after calves that are not their own. It just goes to show how truly special elephants are. And the group focused at the moment, uh, sort of trying to push around fallen trees to get to whatever nutrients happen to have been sheltered underneath them. This particular little herd, and it is, it's an entirely self-contained little group, also has a young male. I don't, I think I see him off in the bushes, but I can't see him right now properly. I think he's hiding away in there. But he, the, the interesting part of this particular family group is that the young male also expends a lot of energy in looking after that calf. So he is definitely her previous baby. So he's definitely the previous calf of the biggest female. And yet he invests so much time in looking after his younger sister that it's truly special to see. You don't often get to observe that kind of behavior, at least in the males. Or the females always babysit the, the, the little one. There's a lion. <laughs> I just need to stop the car more often because whenever I do... <laughs> The animal comes through. There's a lion in there, everybody. There's some cubs. There's cubs running through. Yay! Oh, awesome. Okay, we're going to have to reposition to go forward a little bit. Right, I'm going to stop driving everywhere. What I'm going to do each and every day is I'm going to go stop somewhere and just wait for the animals to come to me. Because apparently that's how it works out here. Hello, my girl. Can I come through? Big girl. <laughs> Sorry, big girl. Guys, I can't. There's the lion. She's coming through. I actually can't reposition without scaring this elephant. Now just bear with me, Ali. Apparently, you're trying not to scream with excitement because everyone in your house is asleep, but, but elephants are your absolute favorite. And now there's a lion. And not only is there a lion, there's miniature lions coming behind her. Look at the ham. They're coming through. Oh, this is awesome. Bear with me, I need to call this in because we're not going to be able to keep up with them. Uh, stations 1 Mufazi Ngala, 2 Mpimpans just crossed east over Hyena Road, right next to this Flamian Lord. Right. Ali, I'm trying not to scream with excitement, but that was awesome. Lions and elephants in the same sighting, including little ones. And I really need to reposition. My big girl, can I go behind you? It's fine. I know. I know. I know. I'm not going to push you, I promise. So guys, important to remember, we're in their home, and it is not appropriate. No, no, don't be naughty. Not appropriate for us to push them away. So I want to get to the lion. She wants to go over here. I've backed up because this is her home, not mine. As exciting as it is to see the lion, it doesn't mean that I have to frighten the elephant at the same time to get there. Hey, big girl. Did you really want that tree? Hmm? Do you mind if I start up again? Standing by, Mike. 
There we go, we can move now. Thank you, girl. Copy, Mike. I've lost visual. She was quite highly mobile uh, past these in both. I'll let you know when I get visual again. Oh, good. Mike is coming to help us keep track of this particular lion. Hi, big girl. Oh, hello, big girl. I can't push past this elephant. She's busy suckling her calf. So as awesome as this is, we are going to relocate them on the other side to ro towards Inyala Road North. I can't push past these elephants and scare them. So while we make a plan and wait for them to shift out of our way, let's go back across to Brent and find out how those little spotted cats are doing. And we've repositioned slightly. We are getting a little bit close to the edge of that. Little cliff face in front of us, don't worry, we're safe. But it, what it does do is it gives us a chance. Oh, there we go. Look at that. <laughs> now, I don't know where the other trouble is. Oh, there we go, that's the tacker tree. Oh, more the tree. Oh, tail. Yay for tails. Leopard cub's favorite toy. Catch the tail. Oof, that must be quite sore. You see, he's actually really hooked it there. Bite it. Oh, I just come a bit wide. The other cub looks like it's about to pounce into the scene from the right. There we go. Here it comes. <laughs> oh, isn't this incredible? So playful in this early morning. Now, as it gets warmer, they're going to calm down. Oh, where's mom off to now? Oh, no, just changing her position. Jandre's going to be quite happy about that. Makes a, a better shot for him. Oh, there we go, boom! <laughs> and tumble down. I reach us would like to know whether Queen Karula would ever deem it acceptable uh, to join her rascal cubs in play. She does from time to time. She most definitely will. those little rascals. I've lost sight of them down the bank on the right. But I've been practicing my art skills while we were gone after we moved just to give you an idea about oh, I need to change my about what have I done? I don't know what I've done. Oh, there we go. About what's happening with the leopard, female leopard territories at the moment. Oh no, no, there's a cub. We shall wait until we do not have cubs before I reveal my masterpiece of art. They're going almost behind us now. You see where they are? Oh, they're back again. 
Come on, climb the tree, go to the kill. We've positioned ourselves perfectly for that. <laughs> yeah, that clickety click click. It's just my camera. Thought it looks like she thought about going up the tree. That looks like little Shungile there. At the base of the tree, to the left and to the right, Asana. She's walking. Oh, she's got some fluff. towards us. Now Claire's wondering, are the cubs less playful and more observant when Karula is not here? Slightly so, they, they will be less playful and they will keep still for longer. It's also because they've got meat in a tree. Um, they will play um, when Karula isn't around but less so than when she is around. Of course she's keeping watch for them. Now, they're right next to us, or oh, Shungile is right next to us at the moment, and I can't see where Hosanna is, so it might come barreling straight towards us, and I'm pretty sure her brother is stalking her, we just can't see him. Oh, she's going to disappear, it's behind us almost. Michael's wondering, is Hosanna bigger than Shungile, or will that only come later? Um, he's probably already a little bit bigger, but from this age onwards, the size difference is going to be far more noticeable. Now, where is the little, the other little monster? Oh, look at that. See, she's going, putting her head in a hole. Maybe she heard something in there looking for possibly a squirrel or a monitor lizard. Now those two creatures generally make up a leopard's first kill. So a leopard cub's first kill is quite often uh, either a water monitor or a rock monitor or a squirrel. Now, I'm not quite sure where trouble number two is. Is she disappearing behind us? Or she's coming to, to have a look, look at us. I mean, so I can't even see her. Jeanre is facing almost directly behind us now. Look at that beautiful light. Wow. Such a gorgeous cat. Here comes trouble number two. Right next, opposite you almost now. So Michael, who's 18, says, Will Shongile have a stronger bond uh, yeah, than with Karula because she's going to inherit some of Karula's territory? Uh, not necessarily. And we've seen what happened with Shadow and, and Karula. Shadow include a growling at each other on the edge of their territories. Now, he's trying to sneak up on sister at the moment. Or he's going to get sidetracked by some... a stick. <laughs> no, actually, he, he, that's very interesting. You can't really see what he's doing. But I didn't notice that there. He's, he's, he's covering 
um, like his mom does, he's covering the stomach contents of the impala to try and stop the smell. Unfortunately, he is just behind a, 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 a Tumbuti tree. There we go. You can see his paw. So mom does that. She tries to cover the stomach contents of the animal she's killed with sand to try and stop the smell spreading and to try and discourage hyenas and lions from finding them. Look at that. Isn't that incredible? Now, that is definitely instinctive behavior. I don't think they would have learned that. towards his sister. Oh, there we go. Down into the, the stalk position. And the bounce. And the bounce is behind the car. <laughs> okay. Okay, well we can't see them, and I think it's possibly time to unveil, unveil the artwork. Oh, there we go. No, John Andres found them again. Well done. No problem. Any time, Tex. They're actually right behind us, so even if we wanted to move the car, we couldn't. I'm quite sure they'll if they get too far, Mom will call them back, and she's actually looking like she's about to give them a, a stern talking to at the moment. I'm waiting. She oh. almost looks like she's about to start calling. Oh, they've disappeared. Oh, jean keeps finding them. Stalk is on. Oh, ears flat, body low to the ground. Oh, probably lost sight of the sibling. Had to lift the head to check what's going on. All got spotted in the stalk. And I'm afraid John is pretty much at the end of where he can swing there. So because of that, it's time, I think, for the artwork of the day. So this is, let me just put that one down. Uh, there's a map. The white is our traverse area. Um, so Sal is, of course, Salahesh, Shadow, Karula, Tandi, 
and then Tundi's unnamed cub. So those are, are the leopards in this particular area. And Kanyuni is further to the east. But what's happened now, I was, we were chatting last night, I was chatting to a friend of mine, he's at Sivambili, and what he's saying is that, let's just get a black pen. Let's see, I'll remember how to do this. Oh, no. Give me one second, sorry. I need a black pen for this. There we go, black pen. Okay, so what's happening is Salahesh is actually almost extended like that. So that is now, Salahesh has moved into Shadow's territory. Shadow has now basically completely, I need a different colored pen, don't I? Um, let's go orange for Shadow. Okay, so Shadow is there. So this is now almost Gauri Main is, I mean, Triple M has become, so Shadow has basically now been pushed into a very narrow little section here so that's shadow now so she's got this area here a really tiny little area and Salahesh has extended her territory now what's probably going to happen is Salahesh's cub is going to take over oh where are you going Karula sorry we can continue this but we've got a leopard walking past us oh no she's coming to cover stomach content So she got, might go to join the cubs. I don't know where the cubs have gone. Oh, I can see a cub behind us. Okay. Jandre, let me just reverse now. Okay. Now we've got to be quite careful how we get out of here. We don't want to go plummeting down the hill. There we go. Hold on, John Dre. Oh. John Dre branch. Sorry about the scraping. comes the other one up from the right and open. There we go. Look at that. Aubrey Krill is coming back to the Nyama. in the open now you can see it's getting a bit warmer so they might not be as playful and we have been sitting here for and being spoilt for a long time there are quite a few other vehicles that are going to want to come here shortly I know we have been here for two hours <laughs> we have been incredibly spoiled oh there's going to be a pounce shortly you can see there's not quite as much bounce to their play and it is getting warmer <laughs> gotcha 
I said, it is getting warmer. And they're probably going to go for a little nap in not too long. Look at that, isn't it just wonderful, the two of them? And they're just becoming so, so relaxed around the vehicles. Where are you off to, mister? off we've still got a little female shungile always coming back is he going to stalk shungile or they're going to stalk each other get ready for the screenshots of the pounce oh, they've both laid down now So we do have to move quite shortly. Okay, so we have been incredibly spoiled, but we are going to have to maneuver our way out of here quite shortly to let the other vehicles get a chance to get in so while we do that let's see how oh wait one last bounce no anyway i think as it gets warmer they're going to start resting shortly so and we will definitely be able to come here on the sunset safari as well all right so let's go and see how jamie's lion hunt is going We've got exciting things happening. We've just seen that lion cross the road and go into a drainage system. Now, I've just spoken to Herbert, who says that the whole pride is there, or at least the whole pride has moved into that area. So we're heading back to that direction to see if we can't catch up with them. Obviously, I had to wait a while before we could move, just in terms of where those elephants were. But I'm going back there now because I think... As Herbert said, the rest of the pride is on their way. They haven't popped out on the other side, so there's a big river system that runs down the middle of these two roads, or between these two roads. And I think that they're hiding somewhere in there, so let's go back and check around that area, see if we can't find them hiding in the drainage system. She was moving fast, and I think she was moving fast because she didn't want to risk the elephants picking up on their presence. Because as far as I could tell, those elephants didn't even register that she was there. But if they had, they would have chased her and the cubs. It's unusual, but it's not impossible or unheard of for elephants to kill lion cubs. So she wanted to make sure that she kept those cubs nice and safe. It's the two little cubs that up until relatively recently we suspected existed, but we weren't 100% sure. It was such a pleasure to realize that the Unkahumas had three sets of cubs rather than two. And these little cubs are not very relaxed with vehicles. They're not all that comfortable with vehicles because they've grown up over the last few or last two or so months of their lives without knowing that vehicles exist. They've probably heard them coming and going, but only in the last few days is it the first time they've properly encountered cars. They're also, as I discovered recently, they're not that comfortable on foot. Because Herbert and myself tracked them two days ago, and they immediately were running away from us. It was interesting, it was the gentle rumbling from the bushes.
country <laughs> from Canada. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm chuckling because it sounds as though you're having an interesting discussion <laughs> all the way across on the other side of the world. There's our elephants, but where are the rest of the lions? We're going to stop and we're going to look at our lovely ellies since they, have, they are so incredibly special. But while we do, we're going to solve Trude's family argument. So, the argument goes, or the argument that they apparently are having, is that prides are made up only of females, and that the males are come sort of, or are classified in coalitions. And yes, you are absolutely right, or I assume that's the point of view that you have taken. A pride of lions is females and their offspring. And now, movies like The Lion King, as wonderful as they may be, have given us this... Oh, it's Hardy Dars. Sorry, just listening to sounds of the bush as well. Have given us this impression that a lion pride consists of one or two males and a group of females. That's not how it works. The prides live together in an area. The females will stay within the pride for the rest of their life unless something strange happens that causes the pride to split into different groups. But for the most part, it consists only of females and their offspring with their own territory. Males will hold a territory, whether it is one male or whether it is a coalition of males, they will hold a ter territory that encompasses a couple of different groups of females, different prides of females. And they're dominant over them. They mate with the females, but they do not stay with them. They do not spend their time with them, and they do not really, if we're going to be completely honest with in terms of interpreting lion behavior, they actually don't really share a bond with the males that are dominant over that particular area. So they, they basically, they accept them as what they are, they're the dominant males at that time. In the next two years, it will be a different group of males that they have to get used to. And that sounds very bright, sorry. <laughs> it's um, very, very bright this morning. Um, so that's the way that prides and coalitions work. I can't look at you, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't. I've got spots in front of my eyes. And not, not leopard spots, just sun spots. <laughs> so Trude, you are absolutely 100% right. A coalition consists of males and a pride consists of females and their offspring. You might get a young male, as with Junior for example. Oh, I was hoping that go away bird was calling at the lions. So with Junior, he stuck around and young males generally do until they're about three years old, three, three and a half, before they move off on their own. Let's just go a little bit further forward. I'm trying to work out exactly where that lioness crossed, and I think she crossed further ahead. Now, our elephants are lovely, but I just want to double-check where she went off the road because I want to just make sure that she didn't lie down in the shade. As soon as she was away from the elephants, I just want to make sure she didn't just lie down with the little cubs. Let's check there first, and then we'll come back to our elephants if we don't have any luck. Somewhere... And the rest of the pride might be making their way in from where she came across as well, because that's what Herbert said. He says he's got tracks for the whole pride. Hello, little girl. Sorry, we're back again. for Jamie. I'm just listening to the Game Drive channel. I confirm, did you have visual of the rest of the Zingala or is it just in Konzo? Okay, copy and come on. Okay, so it seems as though instead of coming this way with the female and her cubs, the rest of the pride have turned back and are going in the opposite direction that they were originally going in. We are just going to poke our noses through here where we saw her walk off because there's a nice, there should be a nice easy area to get into the strange system 
from this angle. You start to become very familiar with an area and all of its entrances and exits. I do know that it gets very, very thick in this drainage system, so I'm just going to poke my nose in and then we will follow up on the rest of the pride. I don't want to... I don't want to walk in here because those cubs, as I said, they get, they're very, very nervous. Oh, hello, antenna. Thank you very much for that. I definitely needed that first thing in the morning. The lioness disappeared just off to my right. Oh, you can join me as we go searching. Perhaps we will find her just lying down somewhere in the shade. But it does, the fact that the rest of the pride turned away from where she is definitely reinforces my idea that she's just going to go and put them somewhere safe, stash them away in this river system. You okay there, Dave? Everybody down. All is well. Dave doing a marvelous job of battling with the plant life. Dave, it's becoming something. I hear that you had quite the experience with Karula yesterday. Totally well. <laughs> okay. All right. This is where it gets a little bit tricky. It's okay. We'll make a plan. We'll definitely make this happen. a big tree. Ouch. Stay there. So she came in through somewhere in this direction. As I said, there's a river system that runs through here. It's not obviously got any water in it at the moment. Ooh, are we going to do this? I guess so. Hopefully Jamie has some luck with that Inkahuma lioness and those little cubbies. I'm going to go give Herbie a hand uh, with the rest of the pride's tracks. Uh, we're actually quite close, so it did take us a little while to get out of that area where Karula is. Uh, but we're now going to head off, see if we can help Herbie, and maybe find some other interesting critters along the way. It just jumps off the vehicle for a quick stretch. So it's, uh, we didn't move too much while we were with Karula and um, Jeanre and myself are both not short people. So it's quite nice after being static for a while to have a, a little stretch. Jeanre is now stretching behind me and being, being, being a clown and blowing me kisses. Oh dear, what we have to put up with these cameramen, I tell you. So Jamie's actually not far from us. She's probably about 200 meters from us there. Well, the one thing we're going to find some, we're going to find some shade. And now that we are out of there, it gives me a good opportunity to finish my leopard diagram of the territories in this area. There we go. Should this be okay, the shade there, John Dre? <laughs> John Ray would prefer me to leave him in the sun uh, and put myself in the shade because he's still defrosting. And so it was quite chilly. And so it's starting to look a bit messy, but hopefully it'll make sense. So as I said, so shadow has now been pushed into this tiny little area here. So that's shadow at the moment. And there we go. There we go. See, I can color in. Wait, let's, let's change. Let's get a paintbrush. Oh, there we go. And there we go. Let's, I'm going to paint with my watercolor paintbrush. There we go. 
I know. So there we go. So that's Shadow. She's really being forced into this very and small area. Whoopsie. And now, luckily for, luckily for her, um, oh, why did it work? Some, there we go. Um, luckily for her, Karula hasn't been utilizing this section of her territory up here much. So Karula has actually been sticking down here. So this is the area that, so Karula's territory is bigger, but this is the area. There's Chelepan. Uh, so she's actually a little bit further than that today, but in the last while, this is the area she's really been using, this bottom section here. So she hasn't been using a lot of her traditional territory up there. And we think that's because the hyena dens, the hyena dens are situated there, there, and there's two up here. The ones that they're using a lot at the moment. So there's a lot of hyenas in that, in that sort of northern section of her territory. And while she's had cubs, um, she's been using that southern section. Sorry, I'm just going to turn this down while I'm doing this. Okay, so we think that's why, or I, we, we guess that's why she's been using the southern section. So there's that, east, uh, that southern boundary we dislike so much that we find her tracks on so often. And she's been using the southern section. They, they do not have a lot of hyena down there. But now that the cubs are a, a bit bigger, um, I'm hoping she's going to move back up into this area now that the cubs are a bit better at avoiding hyenas. So that kill that we were at now is the Mawati, is Chelepan, is probably right on the edge of that line. So about there is where that kill is at the moment. Uh, and Tandi we don't see too much. As you say, we see her down into Cheetah Plains. So I, I need to actually, I need to get a bigger map and we can do all of them. But I think we are going to start seeing a lot more of Salah Hesh. Now, oh, I forgot. Someone asked about Shadow being forced into this really narrow little patch. Is it going to be a problem for her cub? Is her cub at greater danger? Mac and Wisa asked about that. And uh, yes, most definitely. Uh, Shadow is, is, is in, a, in, in a bit of a tight spot, and especially with her cub. Now, what could happen is she might move further into Kruler's territory. Now, there are other leopards up here in the north um, that we don't know. So um, it could be that uh, Inkanyen's sister, that uh, Shiluva 2005 model, not the 2013 model. So there are other leopards we don't know further to the north. Now, Karula can possibly move that way. Uh, we don't, I don't know how dense the leopard densities are in Bofelsok. Um This way, she's unlikely to move because that's going to head down towards Inkanyeni. And uh, Inkanyeni is younger and, and, and fitter. Now, what, what happens with female leopards? So now you see we've got Shadow, which is one of Kula's offspring. You've got Tandi, which is one of Kula's offspring uh, in this area, both females. Now, if Shongile uh, reaches it to over a year, let's find a color for a little Shongi. Um, let's go with blue. Because Salahesh is blue, but she's quite far away, so we can oh, change the color. Here we go. Okay, so what would normally happen, so this section, the southern section uh, that Karula's been spending a lot of her time in, it's quite possible that she will sort of give away quite a big portion of this section down here to Shongile. And what that will do is either force her into the north or into the east, or unlikely that she's going to compete with Shadow because that's her genetics at work. She's done her job as a mom, her genetics at work, and she hopes that Shadow is going to then mate again and spread her genetics. So as a female leopard gets uh, older and older, her territory becomes smaller and smaller. So you probably find, um, I'm not so sure about before my time, but you probably find Krula probably used to do this whole area that Tandy's in um, and that Shadow's in. And she's now given that portion away to Shadow, this portion away to Tandy, and it's likely now that she's going to end up with this northern section. This is getting very messy. <laughs> but she's going to end up with, with this northern section. And if she has another set of cubs again, she gives away and her territory becomes smaller again. So as a, as a female leopard gets older uh, and she, she has more female cubs, so her territory becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Now... 
Oh, there's Jamie. She's running around. So, we're going to, there you go, it's Jamie. So Paige is wondering about Salahesh and Shadow and that dynamic. I almost think we should start again <laughs> on a different map. Maybe you should do that. What do you think, Andre? Is this getting a bit messy? No, it's beautiful. It's beautiful, okay. It's yes. So what's happening here between Salahesha and Shadow is, is quite interesting. Now Paige is wondering, why isn't Shadow fighting back and pushing Salah? Oh, we need a black pen again. Um, why isn't... Why isn't Shadow pushing back into Salahesh and fighting with her? Uh, Salahesh, I think she's a very similar age to, to, to Shadow. Why don't you guys let me know uh, what's the age difference between Shadow and Salahesh? I think they're about the same age. But if we look at Salahesh, she's probably got 20 kilos on Kula. She's a massive female leopard, and she's looking in really good neck when we saw her. Whether the Shadow is not that big a leopard, um, she might be a very aggressive leopard, but I think she's going to try avoid a confrontation with Salahesh because she knows she can probably push into Krula's territory and Krula's going to be a lot more tolerant. Salahesh will not be tolerant uh, and most leopards will try to avoid a fight specifically and especially with a bigger leopard. So that's why Shadow is almost given up and, and moved into this tiny little patch between Hoffman's and Juma. Now this area of Juma where she's been spending a lot of time around here there's only two roads that sort of do that. So there's a massive area around the Gauru Repeater where there's no roads and it's very thick. So I think she's been hiding out in there and we are gonna make a conscious effort to track in that area a bit more often. But um, hopefully that makes a little bit more sense of what's happening with, <laughs> with the female leopard. It's a bit messy, but I think it, it makes it a little bit easier when you can, you can see it on the map and uh, maybe I should start again. But anyway, uh, that's that, how female leopard territories. And I did it so neatly in the beginning and I shaded it and everything. But of course, explaining becomes a bit more complicated. I think maybe we'll do the male leopards uh, next, uh, but I'm definitely gonna have to clear my map. And while I clear my map, let's go see how Jamie's hunt for the lions is going. Here's a little fact about Brent that perhaps you didn't know. Despite whatever um, results his map drawing uh, efforts may have produced, he's actually incredibly artistic. He's actually really very good. But I'm not quite sure that perhaps that medium suits his particular style of artistry. Okay, so we've got some interesting news in terms of what's happening. So the lines have come back in this direction. Now Herbert just told me that it looks as though the tracks are running they're running across in this direction. Perhaps hunting, perhaps just playing. But whatever it is, that lioness was very determinedly moving her cubs when we got to see her with those elephants. So Herbert says his, their li the lion tracks go on top of his tracks. And they're moving back in this direction and the tracks are really, really fresh. So we're going to concentrate on trying to find them here. I'm hoping that some alarm calls might give them away because it doesn't look as though they've crossed the road here. So everybody keep watching these lionesses. That's interesting. There's an Inyala in this drainage system that is looking... No. You okay there, Dave? <laughs> All right, so everybody, that was not Dave. That was entirely the camera. <laughs> we are we sorted now, Dave? <laughs> Our cameramen are, of course, incredibly gifted, but the cameras sometimes play games with them. Perhaps that camera has decided to have a little bit of a sulk because it's cold this morning. doesn't want to work properly. And Yala looking ahead of her she, with a degree of caution. I'm pretty sure that she's seen those lions and she knows where they are and she's just checking to make sure that they have moved out of the area. There's definitely a degree of caution to her movements, which there always is with antelope because when you're on everybody's menu, it makes sense to be extra specially careful. 
but that female Nyala definitely doesn't look 100% comfortable. Herbert's asked me to drive along Gauri Cutline and just check to see whether or not the tracks have come across here. And that is exactly what we shall do. Come on, lions, you've spent two days dodging me, almost. At least 24 hours. Perhaps we should just park the car and wait for them to come to us. Seems to be working out in my favor recently. Got them. And Rachel, welcome to the. They're here. They're somewhere up here. Rachel, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. I've got their tracks, fresh, fresh, fresh tracks on Gauri Cutline going north. Please don't cross into Bubblezook. Now, Rachel's a bit confused by my counting and says, I keep saying that. I keep saying that there are eight cubs, there's eight cubs, but you've only been seeing this lioness with two. Has she lost one? Um, and the answer is we don't know exactly how many she gave birth to, so I can't answer that question whether or not that particular lioness has had cubs. However, this is a different set of cubs. There's three older ones, so the three oldest ones that we saw first. There are three younger, young, young, young ones, and these are the middle group, and there's two of them. So there's eight altogether, three belonging to one mom, three belonging to the other, and then two belonging to the oldest mom, but they're the middle set. They're sort of the middle children. So there's eight cubs altogether, as far as we know, unless barring something unforeseen, if something has happened to them. These lionesses have gone off the road. Where did you go, lions? Okay, Herbert's on these tracks, because I can see his footprints somewhere here. Hmm, it is a mystery. Herbert for Jamie. I hope it's these in Konzo are close to the northern boundary bubbles of going north along Gauri Cutline. Were they here before? Okay, copy. They are just a little bit further to the south of where I am now. They, I've lost them now. That's what I thought. Okay. Copy, thanks. Okay, so Herbert thinks they've now run west. And those tracks that I've seen on Gari Cutline, which is this road that we're on now, those tracks he didn't have before, so although I've seen his footprints, he didn't have tracks there earlier. Which means we are onto a good thing at the moment. They're here somewhere, these tracks are really, really fresh. That log is so deceptive when you're driving along looking out of the corner of your eye. This is such a beautiful log. I want to take it home with me. I can't, but it's such a perfect tree. That's, that's a piece of old, old leadwood. That could be decades old and only just started being invaded by termites. It's very, very hard wood, which means it's completely resistant to borer beetles, but not so much to chainsaws because somebody obviously attempted to cut that presumably to move it out of the road because they're such heavy trees that if they do fall across the road you can't move them unless you cut the cut the tree into pieces it is Im illegal to cut down a piece of lead or to cut a leadwood tree unless it has fallen unless it has broken and the tree has died it is they are entirely protected spe tree species and that's because of their incredible longevity now they've carbon dated a stump yeah, I think it's, oh, where is it? I think it's at the Taba Rest Camp 
It's somewhere in the Kruger National Park. I think it's the Taba. I've been there. I've seen it. But they've carbon dated it. Yes, the Taba. And they've shown that this tree started growing in 1100 and something, and it died in 1600 and something. I can't remember the exact year. So that's basically a 500-year lifespan that the tree was alive. But it is still there now to this day, even though the tree is dead, it's still there as a stump that has not yet collapsed or died in any way. Or oh, it's dead, but it, it hasn't been rotten away, which is absolutely incredible when you think about it. So 500 years living, and then 500 years that it has been dead, but hasn't in, it hasn't been removed by termites or anything. I can hear Herbert. <laughs> I can just hear him trundling along in the Mahindra. All right. Let us continue on. These lions are somewhere here. He says he can see me, so he wants me to go around and check the other side of this densely vegetated area. Oh, I know that these cats are in here somewhere. I think we should get that log for our fireside chat seats. It looks exceptionally more comfortable than our current arrangement. don't have crossed north. You just double check the tracks I just saw. Oh, ground is so hard. Almost impervious to tracks of cats. And cats, of course, walk very, very lightly. Even for a 200 plus pound lioness, they have surprisingly dainty footsteps and they don't necessarily leave very clear tracks behind, especially when the soil's hard after rainfall. I'm really hoping that they haven't crossed, crossed north. Doesn't look like it though. Oh, lionesses are playing games with me. And Herbert, actually. <laughs> We've both been very busy tracking them over the last 24 hours. Standing by. Uh, copy. <laughs> Herbert wants to tell me that he's behind me. On Buffles of cut line. I know he's there. <laughs> oh, he's coming. He's racing towards us. Oh, he's got he's got another tracker with him as well. Let's go and move up next to him. Morning, Good morning, Herbert. How's it, Will? Good. <laughs> Jamie, these galas are avoiding us. Uh, no. In fact, from where you got that, that Mafazi, yeah. she, they, they followed her and left her in the block. And they came back to Lala. So uh -huh. we tracked them and they saw us on foot. They started running into the drainage line. Okay. So from there, they crossed, not far from that... Um, Jacobi. No, no, the Leadwood. Oh, the Leadwood tree. That graded yeah, so yeah. Yeah. So those Ngonzos we saw from coming from the south they, are, are the ones that they we, ones. we started following. Okay. So from there, I think we might have missed the tracks on that uh, uh, hard ground. Entirely so possible. They, yeah, they went. They've gone west. More west. Okay. So we will go back to that area and see if we pick up. Okay. Track. What you can do, maybe try and bubu for us. Okay, I'll try and bubu and I'll check around and bubu and then towards the dam. Maybe they took that path. You know that you game see? path they always take towards the dam from... I, I, I'm sure it's completely different to the ones that we're calling this. This is quite fresh Gonzo. You can uh, see... Those in Gala are mating at Sydney's dam. Yeah. I heard them when I, was sto when I stopped there. Okay. On yeah. the other side? I, yeah, somewhere that side. I couldn't tell you where, but they, they're no. there. No. Okay, yeah, it's different. Yeah, th that's completely different. Yeah. Okay. All right, Herbert, I'll go check Ngubu. Okay. Thanks yes. very much, guys. Okay. Uh, we'll... 
posted. We'll Thank you. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Bye. 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 <laughs> Herbert has got the best smile in the entire world. I really, truly believe that. He's got a smile that no matter what day you can't, you're having, what mood you're in, if Herbert smiles at you, you smile back. There's just something in his personality. All right, so you got most of that update. Um, to lala means to lie down, just to translate. So the lionesses went, followed the lioness with the cubs for a while, changed their mind, went back, and they went to lie down. They saw Herbert and Will on foot and moved to the west, which is where we're checking now. That was a rough translation of that conversation. And I think I'm welcoming Denfin. Is that right, Dave? Denson. Denson. Denson? Denson. Denson. Welcome to our live safari. If you needed any proof that we are live, well, there you go. You have it. I didn't quite hear your name clearly the first time. It is wonderful to have you on board with us. And don't forget that this happens twice a day, every single day, morning and afternoon, out here in the African bush. And we've got all kinds of exciting things that we are dying to show you. So Denson can't believe that this is happening right now. Well, it is, absolutely. And you're absolutely right. It is very, very cool. I still can't believe, I mean, and I've been doing this job for over a year now. I still can't believe that this exists as a possibility. I have no idea how it exists, but it's, I, do, I don't understand the technology behind it, but that's okay. I know that it does work and that it is absolutely awesome. And what it means, Denson, first of all, is that everything you see, because it's live, it means that we can't plan it or script it or edit it in a way that suits the story that we're trying to tell. The, li the animals tell, them, tell us their stories and we just follow along behind and bring you whatever parts of it we can. And it also means that you never know what you can expect. So sitting with those elephants this morning, the lioness was a total surprise. We were in that area looking for lions, but we certainly didn't expect her to pop out with the elephants next to her. We are truly fortunate to be living where we live and where we, and the jobs that we do. We're very, very lucky. Right, and don't forget, Denson, you can send through any other questions or comments that you have on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or, everybody watch out, we're going to get a bit bumpy. <laughs> Just go over that rocky area. Dave nearly went off the back there. Um, or you can email through on questions at wildearth.tv. We absolutely love to hear from you. So, Denson, send us, and any new viewers, send us through your comments and your questions in that way. All right. Let us go and continue on in this search for our lions. In the meantime, I wonder what Brent is up to and what he plans for the rest of his morning. Well, our main plan for the rest of the morning is moving at this exact speed to warm up from being in the, in the drainage line. But uh, what we are doing is we've come to help uh, Jamie. So we're just checking a little bit further away from them. Is checking very slowly and we think the lines are somewhere in this area <laughs> so herbert's got tracks up ahead so they could be down in this little river system it's very thick we can't actually get vehicles in there we just want to check in case they've crossed uh, into this block north of the vuyatela dam but it is an absolutely gorgeous winter's morning and uh, slowly but surely jandre and i are thawing out as you can see, first gear, so the perfect speed. So while we help look for these lions, we'll see if we can add a few birds to the bird lists of everyone out there. So we'll be keeping a lookout for little f feathered flutterings uh, as well as big cats. Now, on foot, this little river system, which is really hard to get into with a vehicle, is exquisitely beautiful uh, to walk in and oh, one of my favorite little sort of secret spots on, um, on Juma. Now up ahead we have an Inyala that 
at this speed it might take us about half an hour to get there so i'm just going to have to speed up for a little bit now the nice thing about where that inyala is going is if it spots a lion it's going to start shouting <coughs> barking i can only see one female at the moment there should, could be a few others around So here are all the lion tracks that they've been following earlier today. And they've gone in here, they've come out, they've gone in again. It'll be very interesting to see. Hello, madam. Oh. She's making the first furry as it's getting a bit warmer into those river rhine thickets. And I'm quite sure the rest are going to follow shortly. And this also gives us a wonderful opportunity to just sit quietly, watch the Inyala as it goes about its daily business, and also listen for any alarm calls in this general area. Very, very peaceful scene here on the edge of the little river system. And that little boy coming out and a walk in front of us. Look at that. So you can see he's starting to get a bit darker and when he becomes an adult he's going to turn chocolate brown is probably the best way to describe it. And there we go. Ooh. And as we said, we're going to look for a few birds. So once that Inyala crosses the road, um, jean andreve when you're done filming the Inyala, there's a beautiful little bird in the road on the right-hand track just beyond the bump. Yeah, tiny on right-hand track. And some a bit closer than that one, <laughs> but that one will do. They are, they are some a bit closer, but there's a little blue wax ball. They're just fiddling around in there. There we go. Little blue wax ball feeding on grass seeds. And there's actually a little bird party coming towards us. So this is actually the perfect spot to sit and enjoy the sun for a while. When we see little wax balls, there's a, a bird called a green winged petilia that I've been trying to get on camera for ages. It's always worth checking carefully around them that they, if there aren't any petilias as well. Now we do have another bird in this bush willow off to our right. I'm just worried it might be a bit silhouetted, so right on the tip of this tree here. Just Oh, he's flown down. I've flown off. Oh, there's a couple of little birds. I just heard from Herbert that those lines have crossed this road. I'm just going to go a little bit further forward, see what other birds are in this bird party. So the edges of little river systems like this, always excellent spots to do a bit of birding. Okay. So we've got a whole bunch of little guys here in this, this area there. So let's have a look. Okay, so they're coming up. It's going to so, where is that? He's going to pop up there. He's moving up through there, where my finger is. A little blackbird. Look, Clark. You can just see a little... There we go. A southern black tit. Not being very photogenic, though. So, 
Okay, here we go. You can see the white on the wings, which is a diagnostic feature of this little guy. And they are very commonly in bird parties. If you see a southern black tit, there's generally going to be five or six other species around. Uh, they like to move in bird parties. Safety in numbers. Oh, chased off another one. So again, we're just listening very carefully. Oh, John, they've got him again. Can you have some helmet strikes? In the, in the depth of the thicket somewhere. Hey, Jean-André. Uh, that little bent bush there. So hopping around just to the bottom of that bent bush. And there, I think it was. There it is. Not the wax bull, there's another. Oh, no, there we go, that's the one. The little crombeck. Little stumpy tail, they don't really have a big tail. Very pretty little guys. Oh, off you guys. Also another common member of bird parties. Okay, now, let me just have a look. See if we can get any more bird species out of here. Birding is just such a wonderful, peaceful thing, and it, it requires quite a bit of patience. So if you sit quietly, and you look and you listen, you can quite often add quite a few species that you might not think were there originally. Ooh, very cool call. Sterling's Sterling's barred warbler. That's quite a quite a good one. You just listen again. That you hear that, John Jay? Now, often when we see them, they're at the tops of trees. Such a beautiful call. Um, I'm going to keep looking. You might pop out, but we just while we try to figure out exactly where this warbler is, John is going to show you the trees, and I'm going to keep quiet. We can listen to all the different sounds around me. So I've got to, actually, before I stop talking, sorry, a little challenge. How many different bird species can you hear uh, while we keep quiet? So we're going to keep quiet for about 30 seconds and see how many different bird species can you hear. I'll do the same and send that list of bird species to questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag it and use the word safari live I don't know how many bird species you got, but unfortunately that, that Sterling's wren warbler stopped calling. But ah, really, they're really pretty, but they're very, very small. And they often sit very high in trees, making them quite diffi difficult to see. Uh, John, did tell me if I must move up or down. Or is that good? There we go. So that's, there we go. And a bright orange eyes, a beautifully barred chest. They used to be called a Sterling's barred wren warbler. Obviously, that was decided it was too much of a mouthful. So, I'm going to wait to see how many bird species you heard before I tell you how many I heard. In the meantime, we're going to keep trundling on in this, on this glorious winter's morning out in the middle of the African bush. Oh, there is another bird species on the right of the little wax bulls. Hop, hop, hopping. Oh, did he fly? Those are the wax bulls. Okay, now... There, it's not down. That is, I'm sure I saw one that wasn't a wax bull in there somewhere. There we go, there it is, there's the patilia. That's the one I've been looking for to get on camera. You can see how beautiful it is. The green winged patilia. Isn't that just the most gorgeous little seed eater? Now, it used to be called a Melba finch. 
and often found in company of wax bulls, but they seem to be a bit more skittish on camera. I've literally been trying for six months to get this beautiful bird uh, on camera to show you. So there we go. I hope that's a new species for a lot of you. And isn't it just the most magnificent little creature? That is the male. Those beautiful bright colors. And quite often, as I said, sitting with a bird party for a little bit longer than you normally would uh, produces some wonderful sightings. So very similar habits to a blue wax ball. Very similar diet as well. So one of the little seed eaters. Scratch, scratch. Come on, pop out and they open again. Okay, while the male's frolicking in there, and see if we can find the female. She's a little bit to the right. And so she just jumped. Uh, come back to the left. Um, wax ball, wax ball. She's in there. Uh, out to the... I think, oh, where's my finger? Um, up to that one, I think, looks like the female. There we go. Yeah, that, that's the little female. You can see not quite as striking as the male. But you can see very similar coloration. She just lacks that really bright orange face. There we go. Waxbill and Patilia together. Munching on grass seeds. Wow, okay. I'm so excited. Chandra laughs at me when I get excited by birds, especially birds that are smaller uh, uh, than uh, a $1 note. I mean, they're, they're, about, they're about this big. They're really tiny. Uh, and that's why they're so difficult to get on camera. But yay, hopefully, I'm really hoping that's a new species for a lot of you. Bye-bye, little patillas. So, Carl and Rachel uh, heard some birds. Carl said he heard three. Uh, Rachel heard five. Jandre, how many did you hear? Oh, Jandre, letting the team down. Uh, no, I, I actually got nine species. Uh, so quite often, I think a lot of the little calls you might have heard, you might have thought they were the same. So there's a very indistinct difference between sort of a patilia and a wax bull uh, and a, a cysticula and a southern black tit. So a lot of times, a lot of practice will help you uh, with that. So and we will keep practicing our bird calls. But there was rattling cysticula, uh, patilias, blue wax bulls. I'm trying to think now, southern black tit. Uh, obviously, of course, the Sterling's Wren Warbler, and what else? I'm trying to remember now. Oh, yes, uh, White Crowd Helmet Shrikes, a Forktail Drongo, a 20 Flank Prinia, and I've forgotten what number nine is for now. So, empty car means Herbie's around here on foot somewhere, following lion tracks. Well, there we go. Well done, Sally in Oregon, the green-winged patilia, number 115 on Sally's bird list. So, I think what we'll do now is we're just going to have a quick look along the northern boundary towards Sydney's dam and hopefully maybe we can add a water bird or two to our bird list for the morning. Let's think, we got is it three or four species that we saw out of, no, three species we saw out of that little bird party. There were of course quite a few around. Um, oh no, we four. It was the Crombeck, 
the patilla, the waxbill, and the southern black tit. So while we head off to try find an aquatic avian creature, I wonder if Jamie's had any luck on those lion tracks. Nope, no luck, unfortunately, no luck to report. We are attempting to follow up on where those lions went, but they are definitely playing games with us on this winter's morning. I think we exhausted our luck when we saw that lioness with those elephants. And so, Dave and myself find ourselves embarking on a fire break drive. Now, there's a big main road not too far away from where we are, and then there is the fire break. And just as its name suggests, it's a clear patch that has been all the plants have been removed so that when if a fire does start it doesn't spread if it comes in from the north it won't spread to the south and vice versa and it wasn't exactly built as a road so it's not nice and smooth and cleared out for us it does make driving for me more interesting get to do some exciting low-range things and it's also one of the lion's favorite places I'm double checking along here to make sure that they haven't popped out somewhere in this region I'm actually going to make my way back towards Bufflesook Dam because I just have a funny feeling that is where they were on their way to. And we're going to do it, but we're going to go on a fire break adventure as we travel along. It's a good place to be. There's lots of water holes along the way, lots of pans, and lots of disappearing dacre, unfortunately. And dacre just hopped off tiny little antelope species that hardly ever stand still long enough for us to get them on camera. Earlier on two of them tricked me into thinking that I had found the lions. I got very excited only to discover that it was in fact a dacre. We have an antelope that might actually stay still. Please boy. Definitely wouldn't be our live safari experience if we didn't put water back on camera at least once. There seem to be so many of them about at the moment. This is a big water buck bull. Only the males have horns. And of course, with their fluffy coats and white rings around their bottoms, they are very, very distinctive. And somewhere here I can hear sand grouse, speaking of birding. Don't, oh, that's another bird, like the patilia, that we hardly ever get on camera. Somewhere. And our water buck are slowly, pretty much, have disappeared into the bush. So let's carry on on our fire break adventure. See what the road's looking, or the fire break's looking like after all that rain that we had. And I'm looking for the sand grouse at the same time. Definitely not a bird that's very easy to spot. I have seen them here before. So actually this is the only place I've seen them on Juma. But they are such well camouflaged birds and they don't move around all that much. Now the sand grouse is an interesting bird. It's sort of similar looking. Oh, clunk goes Wendy. It's very similar looking to the Franklins in a way. And in situations like this where they're nesting and they should start to breed relatively soon, what they will do, what the male and the female both do in terms of clearing for their clutch of eggs, is they'll come to a water hole like the one that we've got here and this is what I mean when I say that there are so many patches of water that are not part of the dams after that rain. How amazing is this? When last did we see a puddle this big? I can tell you when last we saw a puddle this big. It was around March, beginning of March. And lots and lots of water around. And what the sand grouse does in order to provide water for its chicks, because they are actually arid dwelling birds. There's the Namaqua and the Birchels that live in the desert areas. They'll go and do what's known as belly wetting, and they've got special spurs, sort of cup-like spurs on the edge of their wings, on their, oh, sorry, feathers on their belly, that they'll go and they'll dip themselves in the water, and they'll actually, the feathers will scoop up 
the water and they'll carry that enormous distances back to their nest site because obviously the little ones are too small. They're born atricial, so underdeveloped, and the sand grouse will take the water back so that they can have a drink. And they're here somewhere. Still hearing them every now and again. And really truly lovely to see this much water around. It does make our life slightly more difficult because the animals are more spread out. They're not spending time concentrated around the established water holes. They can just go and drink in any puddle that they found. And Megan would like to know if we have chickadee birds. Honestly, Megan, I have absolutely no idea what that is. I'm sorry. I feel like I should. I feel like I, I, I'm definitely missing out on something, but I honestly don't know what a chickadee bird is. But we are going to do some research into it and get back to you on that. I can tell you that we don't, as far as I know, if we have them, we don't call them by that name. Definitely never heard that before. But we will figure it out and get back to you on that. Sorry, Megan. And for all of our other viewers out there who know what a chickadee bird is, if you could provide me with some clarification, that would be absolutely awesome. On hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or email through to questions at wildearth.tv. What on earth is a chickadee bird? Dave? Nope. Nope. We, we are uncertain, but we will do some research into it and get back to you. Hmm. I've learned, well, one thing I can tell you, Megan, is that by the end of this morning's sunrise safari, I will have learned something new, so thank you for that. It's one of the most enjoyable things about conducting these live safari experience. is that we get to learn from the viewers as much as we get to teach things about the various animals that we see. I've learned more about some of the other animals and bird life around the world in the last year than I have in my entire lifetime, just from information that comes through from the viewers or questions that make me think about something in a different way. Definitely something I really, really enjoy about this job. All right, I hope everybody is crossing fingers and holding thumbs and all those things that one does for good luck because we're going to check Buffleswick Dam and I'm really hoping that that lioness has brought her cubs to that in that direction. We have scoured. Herbert has walked Juma flat to find this lion or to find the lions. We have checked every nook and cranny under every rock. Of course, you don't go looking for lions under every rock. They're around. They're just playing hard to get at the moment. Come on, Lioness, please be at Bubbles of Dam. It is my third time driving past here, so I'm getting a little bit of a deja vu feeling like yesterday. Not looking positive. Looks like it's very quiet at Buffalo Dam. I, was, I had hoped that she might have moved through the drainage system since we last saw her. Now oh, those elephants were just, just in the wrong place that we couldn't stay with her and follow her. And in that split second she managed to take those cubs and disappear. But there's no sign of her here. I thought she might have come back here, not for water, just for a comfortable place that she knows very well. And thank you very much to Sally, who's sending information through on the chickadee bird, which is the best, best name I've heard in a long time for a bird. Now the chickadee bird, according to Sally, is a lovely little songbird that is only found in North America. So there we go, we've got the answer to Megan's question, which is no, we don't get them here. We probably, you probably find we've got relatives of the chickadee bird. But that's definitely one of my favorite names for a bird ever. Apparently it's a lovely songbird. There is a squirrel. Ah, oh, there was a squirrel.
Nope, no squirrel. <laughs> squirrel ran away. Animals trying to escape us. <laughs> now while we continue on our lion finding mission, I believe that Brent is still on his birding mission and he's got some interesting things to tell you about a spotted bird. So we have found some birds. Look at that. Here we go. The helmeted guinea fowl. A strange looking creature. Look at the head bopping. Kicking over that. Elephant dung, to see if there's anything tasty underneath it. Now, during the dry season months, guinea fowls live in flocks like we're looking here. And you can get flocks of over 50, 60 in this area, but in the high fault, on the open, big open grasslands, they can go into flocks of five, 600. And then comes the rainy season and they'll split into pairs to mate. All very strange looking birds. Sort of, Jandra and I were just chatting, that remind you of a dinosaur almost, an avian velociraptor. You guys see picking open the elephant dung, looking for termites. Now, they do prefer grass seeds, but they will eat all sorts of things. Her diet would be very, very similar, and their behavior is very, very similar to a chicken. Oh, we found something. Not too much to eat in that pile of elephant dung. And they're going to start spreading out now. And we're going to leave them to forage across sandy patch. And... Uh, we're going to keep on our birding endeavor and we're just going to go slowly down towards Gallego shortcut. Now, I've just heard over the radio that Herbie has found the lion cubs on foot, but no adults. So he found their latest den. So I've got a sneaky suspicion where I think the lions might have gone. So I'm going to go just bird watch through that area. Oh, oh is he going to run? He's going to run. Damn it. A little diker, dikers, disappearing dikers. So, diker is actually a derivative from the Dutch word and of Afrikaans diker, diver. And literally, they just proved why they literally dive through the bush when you spot them and gone. I must say, we are, I'm very much enjoying this sun light, and I'm hoping I'm going to find the lions doing the same, basking with big bellies. Just checking for birds as we go. Now we need to find a new nemesis bird because the patilia has been ticked. Now I know there's one bird we've only managed that I know of to put on camera once and that's the white-throated robin chat. Really difficult. Uh, I've got a few good spots that I, I hear them calling often in the Mawati uh, River but they don't like to call conspicuously so they're very much like most of the robin species, uh, what you describe as skulking birds. And they like to skulk through the undergrowth and thickets and even call um, from inside a thicket rather than out in the open.
So there's a few of you who are wondering how to spell Petilia. If I remember, I'm going to double check, but I remember correctly, it's P-Y-T-I-L-I-A. Uh, but I could be a bit off. Uh, just give me a second and I'll double check it for you. And we want P. That's P-Y-T-I-L-I-A. So there we go, my spelling was on, 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 on point. Uh, that was the green winged patilia. Now, a beautiful little bird that we see quite often in between, in the middle of those two bigger trees, there's a tiny little, oh, there he is hopping up to the top. There we go. Now, one of the more common ones we see, but such a pretty bird nonetheless. Oh, let's hope he jumps into a bit better light. But the chin spot batters. Come on. Into the good light. Here we go, light's getting better. There we go, good batters. So it's a little fly catcher. And you can see that big spot on its chin and it gets its name from. Now they build the most incredible nests. So they will actually collect uh, from webs from communal spiders. I'm hoping I might have a, a picture of a batter's nest. And let's have a look. Sometimes we do get lucky. There we go. And tell me where I must hold, Chandra. Up. up. Or down. Oh, let me find some shade. There's some shade up ahead. But I want to show you. So they build the most incredible nest. And they will s steal spider webs. They'll actually take apart communal spiders' nests while the spiders are there. And... And they'll use that to hold the base together. And then after that, what they'll do is they'll go collect lichen. So let's see if I see any lichen growing on a bark here. So they'll collect lichen and then using the stickiness of the spider web, they will place lichen all over the nest to keep it camouflaged. Now I just find that really, really incredible. They make little cup nests. So a lot of the, the fly catchers, I'm going to put that Shadow, one shadow, there we go, one shadow. That should work a bit better now. Down, up, a bit better. So, there we go, there's that nest. You mean, oh, this is not working, is it, down there? So you can see the branch is there, and then that's the nest. And it's completely covered in lichen, exactly the same as the branch. And... Uh, if you look carefully at it, so they use spider webs to create that incredibly camouflaged nest. So fascinating. Uh, maybe w remind me on the sunset safari to find some, if we find some better shade, I can show you the picture again. But it is, or just Google uh, Batis, B A T I S, Batis nest. Go have a look at those incredibly camouflaged nests that those wonderful little flycatchers make. Hi, Christina, who's in Illinois. Christina's wondering, do any birds in our area utilize termite mounds for nesting? Um, the swallows, after rain, will collect mud from a termite mound to build their nest, but none of them as such nest in termite mounds. Now, there's a very rare bird that uses a specific termite mound, only a termite mound that's been excavated by an art fark, and you have that beautiful art fark burrow, the big burrow. Oh dear, Ellie's rearranging the road again. And so it's called a blue swallow. It's an endangered species. It's a, generally, it lives quite high. So uh, there are some in the mountain regions of, of South Africa, but very, very few. And n nearly 90% of their nests are on the top side of an art fark burrow in a termite mound. Uh, or just an art fark burrow in the ground. But normally art folk do create their burrows depending on the size of termite mounds in termite mounds. But that's the blue swallow. And 
I'm trying to remember. I think there's another bird up in on the border of Zambia uh, and Malawi on the Nika Plateau. There's lots of uh, blue swallows there as well, but that also, I think when the blue swallows aren't using the nest, they parasite the nest. But I'm, oh, I haven't been up that part of the world for oh, 10 years, so I'm a bit rusty on that. So this is the road I think the lions are going to pop out on. Now, just to confuse matters, this is the shortcut off, the second shortcut off Gallagher shortcut. Nyala over there, but that's not lions. Looks like they found a little puddle to have a drink in. Come on, guys, tell us where the lions are. <laughs> Lovely little one lying down to the right there. Hello, little. Oh, not lying down, just standing in a hole. <laughs> Head, there we go, head disappearing into the hole. So obviously there's a bit of water down there. So that's what we were saying, as we were saying yesterday, uh, the animals aren't as for, forced to go to permanent water points at the moment because of these little puddles. They're not going to last very long, but it <coughs> will fly. <coughs> ah, as I breathe in, there goes a fly down the gullet. Early start to breakfast. <coughs> oh, where's my water? Sure. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I don't know why I swallowed a fly. Sure. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I think I've swallowed about... 25 flies since I've been at Safari Live. Um, well, that's the first one for quite a while. What was I saying, jean -Ray, before I swallowed a fly? Permanent water. Permanent water, yes. So, but it does give uh, the permanent water holes a little bit of respite, uh, specifically the bush and grass around them. So the animals can feed further away from that. As I said, it's not going to last very long, uh, but it's just that little gap that will help the bush survive a little bit longer. Come on, lions. Prove me right. Oh, Jamie thinks she's a comedian. Uh, on the other vehicle, she says, well, I have to swallow a spider to catch the fly. But then what do I have to swallow after I've swallowed the spider to catch the spider that, to catch the fly? I can't remember how that... How does it go? You, you must remember, do not I feel like you would know that, not nursery rhyme. No, <laughs> I think it's a bird, actually. Um, I said, I, follow, I, I don't know why I swallowed a fly. I swallowed a spider to catch the fly. And then I swallowed a bird to catch the spider. Then you swallow a cat. Then what else? Then you swallow a dog. I can't remember beyond that. A lion, yes. Trump's all. Or, 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 yeah, leopard catches dogs. We just asked Sindile. Um, I mean, I don't know, we'd have to, at the end you'd have to, or you would probably end up being, after the dog she ate a horse, I don't know why she'd eat a horse after a dog, it sounds like Rebecca in Final Control definitely remembers this one, I don't know why she well, there we go, jean is serenading you now, okay, well it looks like the lion's might have proved me wrong. I think then they're still in those thickets around Gallego camp. What have you spotted? Oh, jean spotted a kingfisher. I haven't seen it yet, so I can't tell you which one. I'll wait for jean to zoom as they go forward. But, oh, there we go. Oh, center frame. Let's see that. Yeah, a beautiful little brown hooded kingfisher, although his hood is quite dark as he's hiding in the shade. There we go. Not 
It does have a bit of electric view, but not nearly as much as the woodlands. It's another one of the insectivorous kingfishers of the family Hallison. Now, out of our Hallison kingfishers, we have two residents that don't migrate. Of course, the woodlands and the grey hooded migrate. Uh, the brown hooded and the striped stays put for the winter. Come on, hop out of the shade. Show us your pretty face. Okay. Quite a useful perch. So they perch sort of sometimes hidden but on the edge of trees and bushes and they'll be waiting to pounce on any insect uh, that moves around. They'll dart down from that perch and grab any grasshoppers or even termites, whatever might be around, especially in the drought. Uh, Kingfish is going to be particularly happy that we had a little bit of rain because it has increased the amount of insects around for him to feed off. Look like he might take off. That little head bubble. He also might just be basking in the glorious sunshine. He forgot his sunglasses, so he's got to keep his head in the shade. Okay, well, it doesn't look like he's going to move anytime soon. Looks quite comfortable there. So, we're going to keep on moving. Well done, I walk in the rain. I completely forgot about the pygmy kingfisher. <clears throat> uh, they sometimes will nest in termite mounds, uh, but generally, uh, and in clay banks, but it, it's less common. They will use hollow trees, but they do nest in termite mounds. But the, the, bird, uh, the birds I'm talking to that sometimes make their nests out of clay from the termite mound are your swallow and swift species. So uh, you barn swallow, Lesser striped, greater striped, red-breasted, blue, all the swallow species will build those little beautiful nests out of clay. And in the bush, they sometimes collect that clay from a termite mound after the rain. Says, I walk in the rain. Okay. I wonder what other little feathered friends we're going to find. Or are we going to find feline friends? So we're going to jump on board with Jamie so she can say her farewells and we're going to search for a few more feathered friends. I've definitely been trying to help Brent out with the feathered friends story. Unfortunately, he's definitely got the camera that is geared towards birding. I hope he knows as well that for the rest of the day I'm going to be singing nursery rhymes about ladies that swallowed flies and spiders and birds and a whole menagerie. That's going to be in my head for the rest of the day. <laughs> there you go. The strange things that come out of a live game drive. So, no success with those lions, unfortunately. However, there is an update for you that's going to make everybody very excited. Herbert and William, who is Aubrey's tracker, 
They, and I can just imagine the heart-stopping moment that they experienced when they found this. While they were tracking the lionesses, they found the den site of the, the newest set of Nkuhuma cubs, the young ones that we've been watching around Buffelshook Dam. They've moved to Gauri Cutline. Just imagine, I mean, put yourself in Herbert's shoes for a moment and just imagine the terror that he bore, and William, at that moment where, and I've done it before myself, where you go, there's cubs there, where's mom? Where is mom and is she about to pounce on us? However, mom is not there, so we're not going in that direction. We will wait until this afternoon and we'll go and double check to see whether or not she has returned to those little cubs. We won't go and sit, because we know that she's not there, we're not going to go and scare them by trying to get in to see them. But exciting, exciting stuff and bravo to Herbert and to William for finding that particular spot. And the lionesses probably aren't too far away from there either. So hopefully for the sunset safari this afternoon, we will have a chance to see them. And just like that, the morning is over. Another lovely morning out here in the African bush. It's gone so quickly on the back of Wendy. So a big thank you to Dave for all of his wonderful camera work, as well as to our lovely ladies in final control, to Rebecca and Chelsea and Jerry. We are... Very stand in awe of all you do each and every day. Most importantly, big thank you to all of you watching across the globe. We'll catch up with you on the Sunset Safari, hopefully with lion cubs, leopard cubs. We've got it all here on Safari Live. See you then, and have a wonderful day. Oh, it's gone. So we're just trying to find a couple of, or one last bird species. Oh, there we go. I oh, know those are wax balls. <laughs> We've seen those ones, but in the road, I'm going to try and get a bit closer, is a starling. Let's go have a look at that gorgeous coloration on that bird in this beautiful morning light. The iridescence should be shimmering. Oh, I took my eye off it for a second. Oh, no, it's still there. It was still there. It'll probably land, no, but that's okay. There we go, it's a bit far off that starling now. And we've got some cooler birds around. Oh, can you get them through there, John? The scimitar bull, just behind the gory bush. Are you, is it behind for you? Okay, let me go. Now this is a really, okay, there's, there's a bit of either side. Here we go. Now, there we go, a common scimitar bull. And you can really see him use that scimitar shaped bull, prying every little nook and cranny in that terminalia. Oh. Now, oh, you know what? This is incredible. Look at that. Now, yesterday, we saw a cardinal woodpecker specifically targeting Terminalia gall wasp and gall ant nests. And today, we've got a, a scimitar bull doing the exact same thing. So those protrusions on the tree are caused by ants or wasps when they bite or sting that, that Terminalia and they lay their eggs inside there and the the tree releases a growth hormone that hardens that area and makes it bigger. But there are bird species that have evolved ways to get into those galls. Really, really cool. Uh, and he's disappeared. Uh, we've got a minute and a half to add another species, hopefully. Now, even when I'm not at work, I tend to spend quite a bit of time bird watching. It is a favorite pastime of mine. Always carry your binoculars with you. Never know what you're going to see. Is that a stump or a cat? I think it could be a stump, but it really looks like a cat from here. Stump. It, it's so funny now. The, it, does, it looks just like a leopard sitting there uh, and watching up here. Uh, it is a stump. 
So from Jandre and myself, I hope you guys enjoyed that incredible time we spent with a Karula and her wonderful little cubs jumping and jawling around. Uh, jawling is a South Africanism for having a party or playing. So uh, from Jandre and Brent who've been jawling around Juma, uh, it's been great having you on the back of the vehicle and we'll see you again hopefully with lion and leopard cubs on the Sunset Safari.